Continually refined and strengthened from the First World War to Desert Storm, the first significant improvement on Puckle's flintlock was an invention by Dr. Richard Gatling. With the Gatling, you have the first heavy machine gun that's effective on the battlefield. Gatling gun is hand cranked and you can get out about 300 rounds a minute. A bullet drops into the top barrel and is locked in place as the crank rotates the barrels. When the loaded barrel reaches the bottom position, a firing pin strikes the bullet. After that barrel has fired, the next loaded barrel moves into position and fires. Unfortunately, it's not adopted by the Union Army because General Ripley, the chief of ordnance during the period, isn't sold on it. He has 198 different calibers of ammunition that he has to supply to the Union Army. He's trying to solve his ammunition problem, so he's not really interested in something like this. Gatling guns were used on a limited scale. But it wasn't until 1885 when another American, Hiram Maxim, perfected a weapon that could fire 600 shots a minute with no more effort than a finger on a trigger. Maxim used the energy of the gun's recoil to load, cock, fire, and eject shells. As Maxim's gun is fired, the recoil impact forces the breech block backwards. The breech lock then moves forward. Maxim's invention was received with great enthusiasm in Europe. By 1914, Germany had over 12,000 machine guns in service with her army. When the machine gun came to be used during the Great War, it was seen as a heavy support weapon laying down a blanket of fire to support and protect the infantry. For this reason, the machine guns were built as heavy guns capable of firing for extended periods of time. As a result, most of the machine guns were water-cooled. The barrel was surrounded by a large cylindrical water jacket. There was a hose connected to a condenser tank that circulated water back into the water jacket so that the gun would not run dry. Surrounding the barrel with water improved the gun's effectiveness. Water-cooled machine guns were capable of firing for long periods of time. Several hundred rounds could be fired before the gun had to be allowed to cool. Normally you have a crew of two. You have the gunner and you have an assistant gunner who is responsible for the ammunition supply. You would need three men to carry a 50 caliber gun into battle. Two men could do it, but they'd be terribly loaded. Even seasoned gunners struggled to keep targets within their sights. A good machine gunner is an artist at firing a weapon. It's a pretty jarring. It shakes the living daylights out of you. If it just doesn't sit there where you are aiming, you have to hold on to that trigger in the handle. And it, it just shakes your whole body while you're firing it. Once you start firing, the gunner will sit there normally holding on to the the spade trails and working the triggers. And every now and again, he will reach up and he'll bang the gun on one side. And what he's doing, he's traversing the gun with what is known as the T and E mechanism, or the traversing and elevation mechanism. And that's what makes a machine gun so effective. The gun in and of itself fires fast, but the thing that keeps it on target is the T&E mechanism. Employed in pairs, the machine guns swept a stream of fire back and forth over the battlefield. So you can quite literally have a curtain of steel in front of your position. And you combine that with barbed wire that holds up the other guy, and you have an effective way to stop these infantry attacks. Machine guns left the infantrymen no choice but to dig in and fight for survival from inside trenches. We were very afraid of machine gun fire. And the sound was terrifying because we never heard 
anything like that. When you hear that, and you're laying on your belly or in the mud somewhere, and you hear the knees and the branches all around you falling and being clipped off by the staccato bursts that come from all directions and seas. They, uh, they, they sound mean and dangerous. We just prayed that we, we wouldn't get hit. You never think that it's going to hit you as so it's going to hit the other guy. You feel stark naked, and you see dirt flying all around you. You see men falling, and it's a sensation, and the guns keep barking. There's no place you can hide. You just have to pray to the good Lord that it's not going to hit you. You'll always see somebody falter, go down. You see them hung up in the wire, just shot to be riddled. They got hung up, couldn't get out, so the gunners had take target practice on them. No, it's, a, it's a grisly thing that hard to believe until it's around you. You can see it yourself. It was a measure of poor generalship that for much of World War I, the general staffs could think of nothing better than sending ranks of infantry or even cavalry into masses of German heavy machine guns laying down fire that often wiped out entire companies of infantry as they advanced across no man's land. It's just plain murder. Pack up your gear and go over to the top broad daylight right in the face of these murderous weapons. But even in the face of horrific machine gun fire, Winston Roche went over the top. I didn't know that I was hit by a machine gun. The only thing I do, I thought somebody had pushed me because I was knocked sideways and fell face down into the mud. And the bullet went through my side, passed between two of my ribs and out. I lay there gasping for breath from the, the shock and uh, the fright. And I'm sure I wet my pants because I could feel it warm down both legs. And uh, it was the blood. Heavy machine guns paralyzed the battlefield. If the infantry was ever to advance and gain ground, they needed a more mobile weapon, a light machine gun. Light machine guns were developed for use by small infantry units, typically squads or sections. What the light machine gun did was increase the firepower of the infantry unit and because it was either handheld or mounted on a bipod, it didn't have the accuracy of the heavy machine gun. Instead of Maxim's recoil system, light machine guns used a small portion of the gases produced by the fired round to force back a piston. The piston in turn pushed back the breech block and readied the gun to fire again. The most successful gas operated gun was the Lewis gun. The British Lewis light machine gun was regarded as one of the best weapons of the First World War. Uh, the Americans in World War I originally had been issued British Lewis guns, which they liked very much. And then these were taken away and replaced with French weapons. The French give us a light machine gun called the Shosho. It is, beyond a doubt, the worst piece of garbage ever inflicted on the American soldier. The state of manufacture in these weapons was so bad that you couldn't take one and put the parts in another and make the other one work. It was just awful. We were using guns that had been in action for three years. 
The show show was a good gun. It was very simple. You could disassemble it very quickly and seem more or less as the lowest. But after these guns had been in existence and used, fired thousands of rounds, they were worn out. They cut holes in the side of the magazine so the soldiers could see how much ammunition they had left. But in the trenches, you get sand and dirt and, and filth inside these magazines, and it just didn't work. Machine guns set up in defensive positions turned the Great War into a quagmire fought from trenches. But it was also the machine guns, this time in armored vehicles, that broke the stalemate. The tank originated as really nothing more than a way to safely move the machine gun across no man's land. You could drive them right in to and against a pillbox. You hear the bullets. Sneak him off the side, as I say, just beat the tattoo on the underneath side. Very, very scary, and the noise is deafening. They were fun to drive, and I poured it far right in. I tried to hit the slits, and it did silence the gun. Hitting anything from the rickety tanks required much gunnery practice. It's very difficult to aim them properly. See, the guns were fixed, and you could lose the clamps, but you'd have to be standing still because you couldn't drive it and aim it. At the same time, you'd have to aim the whole tank. These mobile machine gun nests took the advantage away from the defenders and gave attackers a chance to gain and hold territory. As tanks moved ahead, the infantry could also move forward without leaving behind the firepower of their machine guns. A new lightweight rapid fire weapon gave soldiers an opportunity to exploit a breakthrough made by tanks. Developed in the closing months of the war, John Browning's automatic rifle gave the infantrymen used to single-shot rifles a way to sustain a high rate of fire while on the move. The BAR would soon redefine infantry tactics. The Browning automatic rifle replaces the Shosho as a base of fire weapon. Infantry tactics revolve around gaining fire superiority, so what you want to do is to lay down a base of fire so that you can maneuver an element against the enemy. Each squad carried one BAR. The man handling the BAR was responsible for maintaining a sustained rate of fire so that his squad members could maneuver against their objective. It was a good bit heavier than a rifle was extremely effective as an infantry weapon because a man could carry it with him and move it forward and support the infantry when they were trying to advance or could also support them when they were trying to defend themselves. It fired just like a machine gun except it didn't have as many rounds to fire. The weapon's barrel could not be changed and the magazine held only 20 rounds so there was no real capability for sustaining a high rate of fire. But the 30 caliber BAR was very rugged and reliable. In World War II, it was used on all fronts whenever the infantry could use the additional firepower that it could deliver. The British Army used similar infantry tactics, but they counted on the best magazine-fed light machine gun used during the war. The simple, reliable Bren gun. Interesting thing about the Bren gun is that it's not even British. It was a Czech light machine gun. The British thought enough of the weapon to produce it under license and called it the Bren from Brno, the Czech town where it was designed, 
and Enfield, the British armory that built it. It was air-cooled, relatively light. It had a fairly low rate of fire, but was quite reliable. It was uh, fed by a 30-round box magazine mounted on top of the receiver. And it was as well-loved in the British Army as the BAR was in the American Army. When you're on your stomach, it's easier to load, of course, from the top than it is from the bottom. If you think about it, uh, loading from the top is using gravity to your, your advantage. The brand also offered the important advantage of a quick-change barrel. A hot barrel could be quickly removed and replaced with a spare. With this feature, the Bren could continue firing and not overheat. When the British required more firepower, they moved up their heavy Vickers machine guns. When the Americans needed more firepower than the BAR could provide, they turned to the belt-fed 30 caliber Browning medium machine gun. A magazine-fed weapon, you, you fire, say, 30, 40, 50 rounds, whatever you have in the magazine, then you have to change the magazine. With a belt-fed weapon, you can fire as many rounds as you wish. The advantage is you get more sustained firepower than you do from a magazine-fed weapon. Introduced by John Browning in the last days of World War I, the guns came in two versions, a water-cooled version that circulated water around the barrel, and a second type cooled by air. The guns were essentially the same except the water-cooled gun. You could fire it a whole lot longer without the barrel getting too hot. If it was an air-cooled gun, you could fire it so many rounds, you had to let it cool off a little bit, and then you could fire it some more. But they were both excellent guns. Both guns, the M1917 and the M1919, could sustain a rate of fire as high as 600 rounds a minute to an effective range of about 500 yards. With simple recoil mechanisms, they were particularly rugged weapons under extreme conditions of temperature, dust, or mud. These guns were used primarily against heavy troop attacks and to command such strategic areas as bridges, streets, and hilltops. 68,000 of Browning's machine guns saw combat action. Ready? What? Oh, sorry, you didn't get that. <laughs> the American Army used its machine guns as a supplement to the aimed fire of the individual riflemen. The machine gunner was there to help the infantryman reach his objective. But in the German army, that relationship was reversed. The German infantryman was there to ensure that the machine gunner achieved his goal. Uninhibited by conventional thought, German leaders conceived of a new way to employ their machine guns. In the German army, the doctrine that developed was that the light machine gun would be the standard field of fire weapon and would be supported by infantry who would take out targets that the machine guns did not hit, be responsible for supporting the machine gun, protecting it, and as a result the German army had a far greater complement of machine guns than most allied armies of the period did. One machine gun is as good as maybe 20 single shot riflemen and uh, the uh, firepower is, is, is enormous. One machine gun could hold down a whole section of the enemy line and the rest of the company was able to advance under this firepower forward. The weapon designed to implement this new doctrine was the machine Gewehr 34, the MG 34. The German MG 34 was a masterpiece of design. The Germans wanted to develop a weapon that was versatile enough that it could serve the function of a heavy machine gun and still have the portability of a light machine gun. The aspect of the design that enabled this convertibility, if you will, was a quick change barrel. In rapid firing, the barrel gets hot, so you have to change it after every 300 rounds or so. And with that one, you just flipped one, one bottom on the side and the barrel came out. It was red hot, so you had to have some gloves 
put it on the side, let it cool off, and put in the next one. And this added to the firepower in comparison to American machine guns. I guess you needed a screwdriver to take it apart, change the barrel. And it took at least five times as long to change uh, the barrel in combat. Most machine guns were issued with two or three spare barrels, which enabled the crew to rotate them through as needed. And it was not unusual for German MG34s to fire thousands of rounds of ammunition uh, in a day of heavy engagements. The Germans also replaced the old canvas ammo belts with a new device. It was a metal belt which could be reloaded and uh, therefore it didn't bend too much. It was uh, quite heavy, but uh, it was for this reason also more dependable and therewith we, we didn't mind the, the weight because we knew it, it would shoot. This machine gun was our main source of firepower for the combat unit. You stick it in the back seat of an aircraft, uh, you can stick it on top of a tank, you can stick it in the, in the hands of the infantry. So it, it becomes sort of a universal gun. They can do many, many different jobs and do them effectively. But too few factories could machine the complicated parts required for the MG-34. Production could not meet the growing demand of the German army. The MG-42 was designed at the request of the German army who wanted a weapon that would be cheaper to build and more reliable under severe combat conditions than the very well-crafted MG-34. Relatively few complicated parts were used. And in an attempt to make the weapon even more versatile, the barrel design was altered so that now the barrel could be ejected from the side of the barrel jacket. It took less than 10 seconds to change the barrel on an MG-42 and the gun was ready to fire. It was marginally lighter than the MG-34. It was not as well made, its tolerances were looser, it was not quite as accurate, but it was far more reliable. And the rate of fire was increased to between 1,200 and 1,500 rounds a minute. The rate of fire was higher than any other gun ever produced, but it cost the gun its accuracy. Once the first rounds left the barrel, the excessive recoil shook the gun out of control. You had to lie down. It was not possible to walk with it or to kneel because the recoil was so strong that uh, an average man of my weight uh, would have been pushed backwards. The idea really was to use the weapon under ideal circumstances as a very long-range shotgun firing a burst of rounds that would hit in the impact area almost at the same time. Most of the times we didn't even have to aim. We just were shooting with it over the heads of the, of the enemy and uh, they just kept running away because they could not stand that roar. They were shooting so fast that our ear could not register single explosions like a normal machine gun, like the 34. But it was just a roar. Wow! Wow! You, half a second and you had out about a hundred bullets. The roar and the high rate of fire were thought to be so intimidating that the U.S. Army produced a film that they had hoped would prove to new recruits they had nothing to fear. Listen to that. Fast. That thing sprays a lot of lead. And you're scared, because the German gun fires faster than anything you've run into before. Nobody seems especially afraid of that gun. Nobody but the replacement, who can't get over the fast burp of that German gun. Well, so it does have a high rate of fire. Does that mean it's a better fighting weapon than ours? The main disadvantage of the machine gun 42 was the fact that it used so much uh, ammunition and uh, so we were only permitted to shoot very short times to pull the trigger not longer than a second because of 50 to 100 rounds were going out like nothing and uh, you run out of ammunition 
The German concept of developing one machine gun that could meet a variety of needs influenced all future machine gun development. gun position should look. Remember, their bark is worse than their bite. The heaviest machine gun employed by the U.S. Army in World War II was an enlarged version of Browning's 30 caliber medium machine gun. The 50 caliber M2 heavy machine gun fired a very powerful half-inch diameter lead slug nearly 2,000 yards accurately. Interestingly enough, when it appeared, it was first classified as an anti-tank gun. In the 1920s, the 50 caliber Browning would have been effective against the overwhelming majority of tanks and certainly all of the armored cars that were in service. A 50 caliber was really a powerful weapon. Most of our machine gun ammunition were loaded in repetitive steps of five rounds each. You had two rounds of ball ammunition. Ball ammunition is just plain lead with a steel jacket and a copper covering over it, and that's used against personnel. Then you'd have one round of incendiary ammunition, white burning phosphorus, which when you shoot in a gas tank or something like that, it's set on fire. Then you had a tracer, which would put out a red marker. What it does, it leaves a trail of white hot light, which the gunner can then use to determine his exact fall of fire. The disadvantage of tracers is that while they are very useful for showing you where your fire is going, they also show the enemy where your fire is going. And then we have one round of armor piercing. The 50 cal would go through a half to three quarters of an inch and would do a pretty good job on one inch of armor, wouldn't quite go all the way through it. And you could knock out a German armored car or a lightly armored vehicle, but it wouldn't go through a tank. The Browning had a normal rate of fire of about 500 rounds per minute. The rate of fire was sufficiently slow that a good gunner could tap off one or two rounds fairly reliably just by hitting the trigger with a fairly light touch. The Germans were terrified of that weapon. They absolutely, they could, you could hear it, it had a very different sound than a, than a 30 caliber. We had an instant one time where we had just gotten in Normandy. It was the first day we were in combat. And we were trying to maintain our tanks and try to fix them. And all of a sudden, we got this sniper fire coming in. And everybody hits the damn deck and hits the ground. And the guys that left that damn rifles over the truck somewhere and they couldn't find the rifles. Everybody was in that kind of panic. And so then they got up again and to get another shot. A sniper fire is very discouraging because you can't tell where it's coming from. You don't have any idea what direction it is. So the, a, a single sniper just completely stopped the whole platoon from working. One of our guys thought it should come across the street in a big pine tree. So about that time, a half-track came down the road and had a 50 cal machine gun on it. And so they saw our crew paying down, and they slowed down, and one of our guys pointed over that in the tree, and the man on the ring now, the 50 cal, must have spotted him because he swung that 50 cal around and let go one burst, and the whole top of that tree just exploded, and the sniper came down to the ground, and that was the end of that. And so I began to realize that that 50 cal put a damn awesome weapon. The long range and heavy bullet of the 50 caliber made it an obvious choice when the Army was designing an anti-aircraft weapon. Four guns were mounted on a highly mobile half-track. We had uh, one anti-aircraft battalion attached to each Army division. They had the M15 half-track, which had four 50 cal machine guns on it. They could be used for anti-aircraft fire. They could also be used for anti personnel fire, and these systems were deadly. The electrically controlled gun turret could rotate 360 degrees and elevate 90 degrees. The guns were modified so that ammunition could be fed from either side. When fired together, the four machine guns could send over 2,000 rounds a minute to meet any attacking aircraft. Quad 50 was also turned against ground targets. 
War Industries also produced thousands of 50 caliber machine guns to give combat aircraft a greater punch. This combination of firepower and fighter was unmatched in the P-51 Mustang. The P-51 was uh, a fine airplane. It had six forward firing machine guns. We had a lot of latitude as to how we want those guns to fire. And some guys wanted those 650s to converge on a point out there the size of a four-bit piece at 300 yards. All six guns passing through that same very small dynamiter, which gives you a tremendous impact. Other guys wanted the outside guns to reach out to 350 yards, and his middle guns at uh, three and a quarter, and his inside guns maybe as close as 250 yards, which gave him a long cone of fire. I like to have them all passing through a little, a little dot out there that I could barely see. Fighter aircraft used their guns offensively to take the fight to the enemy. But bombers like the B-17 used their guns for defense. 1350 caliber guns justifiably earned the B-17 its nickname, a flying fortress. The guns bristled from all around the aircraft from nose positions, waist positions, to twin turrets that could follow the attacking fighters. No matter how skilled the aerial gunners, it was never easy to hit the fast-moving, quick-turning German planes. A better system for aiming the defensive guns was incorporated in a new bomber, a long-range B-29 Super Fortress. There was no handheld guns which were ineffective uh, against fighter attacks, no matter how you say it. Uh, the effectiveness of our guns was much different. We had remote control guns. We didn't sit in a turret, you know, on a B-29 like they did in the B-17. The navigator had to merely set the altitude, speed, and temperature into the computer. And the uh, computer would take care of all the ballistics as far as uh, firing at an end of the airplane. You had a, a site that had a little... 70 mil ring uh, sight on it. The gunner got that sucker on the enemy aircraft and he was within range. He's probably going to hit that airplane. From its role as an anti aircraft weapon, anti tank weapon, and heavy defense weapon, the 50 caliber Browning proved itself as one of the most versatile and effective machine guns fielded in combat. caliber and the smaller M1917-30 caliber served with the U.S. Army basically unchanged in the Korean War and through the 1950s. The unparalleled reliability of the Browning machine guns was the reason for their long successful service record. Following the Korean War, the rifleman's M1 Garand rifle was replaced with the M14 rifle. Unlike the M1, the M14 could fire in bursts or fully automatic like the BAR. It was also time to replace the older machine guns with more capable, lighter, base-of-fire weapons. During the Second World War, Americans captured examples of the MG42 in North Africa. They were extremely impressed with the weapon. Although they felt the rate of fire was too high, they marveled at its simplicity, its reliability, and its ease of manufacture. These important features, which proved very successful for the Germans' MG-42, were carefully tested and re-examined. When it comes time for us to redesign a new machine gun with interchangeable barrel, our designers take the German idea of the feed plate and feed mechanism in the uh, MG-42 and design our gun around that particular feed mechanism. The M60 general purpose machine gun first introduced in 1959 used the reliable gas-driven bolt action of the World War I Lewis gun and BAR. 
the feed mechanism of the German MG42, and the quick-change barrel feature of the British Bren gun. If you open up the feed plate cover of an M60 and the MG42, you're going to find that they're going to be identical. At 550 to 600 rounds a minute, the rate of fire of the M60 was not that much higher than the weapons it replaced. But the improved design was much better suited to the requirements of modern combat. But early tests of the first M60s revealed flaws. There are a few problems with it. One of the things is that you cannot change the barrel with a handle. You have to grab the thing with a mitt that's issued with the gun. But it's still a very good gun, used to great effect in Vietnam. In the jungles of Vietnam, firefights came fast and furious. Firepower had to be brought to bear quickly and accurately. The M60 machine gun was the weapon that often made the difference for the soldiers and marines on the battlefield. Variants of the M60 could be fitted above the skids of Huey helicopters. A sighting linkage allowed the guns to be aimed and fired from inside the cockpit. M60 machine guns turned the vulnerable troop transports into lethal gunships. Machine guns mounted in the open doors gave gunners greater flexibility. M60s pouring thousands of rounds into the dense green jungle seemed almost symbolic of the frustrations of fighting the war in Vietnam. One of the most interesting developments in the past few decades has been the rebirth of the Gatling gun. In the 1950s and 60s, the Air Force in particular was interested in developing weapons that had a higher rate of fire than the traditional aircraft machine gun. The Gatling proved to be the perfect answer in that with a six-barrel Gatling gun firing at a rate of, say, 3,600 rounds a minute, each barrel was being fired only at a 600 round per minute rate of fire. With the blast of air going down each open bore, this was sufficiently slow to keep the weapon cool enough to operate. Multi-barreled rotary machine guns were used in many ways and offered one other tremendous advantage. Powered by an external source, it was not affected by duds or misfires. The weapon simply ejected the live cartridge case that had not fired along with the empties. In Warthog, a 30mm Gatling gun puts the bust in Tank Buster, firing armor-piercing shells of depleted uranium at up to 4,000 rounds a minute. The A-10's gun decimated Iraqi armor during the Persian Gulf War. Today's infantry depends on many familiar weapons. The M250 caliber still lives up to its reputation, and the M60 general purpose machine gun remains a base of fire weapon. Withdrawn from the inventory after Vietnam, but recently returned to use by the Marines, the Mark 19 launches 40 millimeter grenades at a rate of 375 rounds a minute. A new weapon that significantly boosts the firepower of the Marines is the SAW, the Squad Automatic Weapon. The Squad Automatic Weapon, it's called the M249 Squad Automatic Weapon. It shoots 5.56 bullet, which is the same bullet that's also fired by an M16. The ammunition comes in a drum of 200 rounds. It also can fire the same magazine that M16 fires. It's an air-cooled, strictly automatic weapon, and that weapon is used primarily to uh, suppress enemy targets in order to hold their heads down while the Marines are moving up onto an objective. 
The Marine squad consists of 13 men, a leader, and three four-man fire teams. They alternate rushing an objective so that not all of the men are exposed to enemy fire at the same time. Each man uses his weapon to cover the advance of the others. Three members of each fire team carry the M16 rifle. And then the backbone of the firepower, the, the main punch of that fire team is the last man who carries the, the squad automatic weapon. The lethality of the modern battlefield could send infantrymen fleeing for trenches like their World War I forefathers. But it is the machine gun, mobile firepower, that keeps the infantry moving forward to win their objective.